Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend Kurt Ekstrom, who is a collector, player, and an expert on WFL drums. Kurt, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how's it going? Good. Glad to have you here. Um, I've, I've heard your name around the, the community for a while of, of really being a, a kind of an authority on this stuff. And WFL is really an interesting topic because it's sort of like a it's just a it's kind of a confusing thing sometimes when people look at, well, is it Ludwig? Is it is it not Ludwig? Was Ludwig going on while WFL existed, which we'll talk about? Um, so maybe we just start a little bit with what got you into these this specific brand um, to study and collect? So I I'll try not to be too long winded with it, but I started playing drums when I was around 12 years old and um Everybody that I liked or everybody that I at least discovered was playing a Ludwig set. I didn't really know anything else. It was like the early 80s. And all I remember seeing were those blue olive badges. And I was a a big Van Halen fan, all that stuff. And my teacher, everybody played Ludwigs. And so when it came time to get a first set, I just was all I could think was, I wonder what that Ludwig set's going to look like. And my teacher, of course, was like, what is getting you set? So I was like, "Uh, what does that mean? (laughs) And so, of course, uh, I, I wound up with the Gretsch, which I still own, but I always wanted that Ludwig. And so um, I ordered a brand new set around 1990 and it was, it was a nice set, but I started really getting into like the whole vintage thing just caught my ear, like Buddy Rich and all that other stuff and John Densmore. And, and so I started researching like a little bit on my own about old, you know, like sixties Ludwigs. And then made me start going, okay, well, what, what, what came before that? Because there was no internet and there was no none of this stuff. And so um, what really got me uh, onto the WFL stuff was I was reading Modern Drummer and I saw an article by Harry Kangany about the twin strainer WFL. And I was like, wow, that is a really cool looking drum. Like I, I just never seen anything like it. I was really drawn towards it. And um, basically what happened was, is I just kind of said to myself, I'd like to see one of those just so I could see what one looks like. And my mom at the time had been like, you know, if you're going to start collecting drums, you probably should like start looking at auctions and looking at the Mm. newspaper and blah, blah. So I did. And I started, you know, I saw an auction that just said Ludwig drum set with symbols and it didn't say anything. And so I went to this auction and looked around and I was like, I don't see a drum set. And eventually in the back corner, there was an old bass drum that was really old. And there was some like rusted old hardware. And I saw the top head of a drum in this case and I pulled it out. And I almost dropped it because it was a mint, like original 1937 WFL twin strainer, like nicer than the one Hen- <laughs> Harry had put. And I was like, are you kidding Whoa. me right now? And so <laughs> I saw, so of course, I had to wait and through this auction and the poor, you know, the, the poor guy's, you know, belongings and stuff from his whole life was all over the lawn while they auctioned away his, you know, his Lionel trains and all this stuff. And yeah. And so long story short, I, I battled out the drum and won it for like 55 bucks. Whoa. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, so that was back in 1993. So that was, that started my whole, like, okay, I'm a, I'm a WFL guy. Like, well, what is this stuff and what, how do I, and so basically I started going to drum shows around then and I started, you know, looking for catalogs. And so every time I would go to a drum show, I would hunt around the parts, bins and all that. And eventually like, you know, I'd scour anything that said WFL on it. And so I created my own little hoard of, pieces and parts from over the years, like a little squirrel collecting nuts, you know, like, so uh, <laughs> yeah. it just kind of worked out that way. Long story short, yeah. to answer your your earlier question, I'm a definitely a proponent of the, uh, somebody that, you know, says WFLs are actually the Ludwigs. So William F. Ludwig started those, you know, that's, you know, I pay, you know, I have a lot of respect for William F. Ludwig and the way they started and all that. And so the, uh, the Ludwig and Ludwigers are the, the imposters. <laughs> that's which we're going to talk about that because Ludwig does have like the the iterations of Ludwig and Ludwig, uh, Leedy and Ludwig, Ludwig, yes. and there's and WFL. Can, yeah. And I also find it funny how the actual current Ludwig company, a lot of times it's just and nobody else cares. This is me for geeky on this stuff, but they they mix and match stuff that would have been, you know, cons Ludwig versus modern you know, WFL's uh, Ludwig. And so, sure. so it's kind of funny. Like when I see classic lugs in a top hat cane finish that are from two different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So 
I think um, there's been some some, you know, we've had a lot of Ludwig episodes on the show. And actually, like a couple weeks ago, Uli Salazar was on doing a super yep. episode, which normally I like to kind of like, you know, have a lot of variety. But it just lined up where we were doing a WFL one pretty soon to that. So um, just take us through what happened and uh, not the whole 1909 history of Ludwig. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of been covered. People can find that. I'll put links in the description for previous Ludwig episodes. But maybe let's pick it up because, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, WFL was 1937 to 1955. Is that right? Yeah, 54, maybe. You know, okay. uh, well, the badges ran longer, like like one common theme that will run throughout Ludwig throughout history altogether is that William F. Ludwig lived through a depression and he just never liked to waste anything. So sure. they used up like literally everything until it was gone. Yeah. And it didn't really matter what the, you know, the, the monogram or the logo on it was. It was just, we're using this cause it works and we still have some left. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that being said, let's kind of get into the history of this and figure out what happened. So, uh, because like, I mean, it's, it's Ludwig and Ludwig in that point. Um, the Theobald correct was the brother and he, yes. had, he had passed away. Like influenza or something. Pretty early on in the yeah. history of, okay, which is, uh, it's interesting. It's kind of like the Allman Brothers, how Dwayne Allman died pretty right. early on, but they remained the Allman Brothers um, for until today. But um, all right. So what happened? Why did it become a separate company? So the so basically in the end of the 20s, Ludwig and Ludwig got into the banjo business and plus the uh, the the advent of the talkies came out. So it sort of put the pit drummers out of work a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so those two things, like they got really heavily into the banjos and, and geared up for it. And then like the depression hit and it just, everything just kind of fell, fell apart. And so Ulysses Leedy was actually the first one to like to sell to Khan. So they got, you know, Leedy Khan picked them up and then Ludwig followed suit probably, you know, 1929, 1930 or somewhere around there. And so, but from what I understand, uh, William F. Ludwig Sr. was a promise that, you know, you can still run things. It's your company, blah, blah, blah. We'll, we'll still keep things going the way they had been. It's just, you know, now they're going to be run by Khan. Well, uh, apparently not shortly after that, they moved all their operations and processes down to Indianapolis where Leedy was. So the only way I can think of it is they had like a big, huge factory. And on one side of the building, they were making you know, the Ludwig and Ludwigs. And on the other side, they're making the lady stuff. Yeah. And according to Mr. Ludwig, he got frustrated just because more attention and funds were being put into lady versus the Ludwig. And then whenever he had ideas or things that he wanted to do, they just, just didn't really, you know, listen to him and he kind of get shut down. And, and I think he just got frustrated. And after about six years, he decided to, you know, what, uh, I, I just can't do this anymore. I'd rather, I'd rather have my own company. And, he and his wife talked it out and had long talks over it. And they just decided, you know, we're going to try this. And sadly, what they say is that when he, his stock that was worth a million dollars in 1929 dwindled down to like a uh, hundred thousand dollars in 1937. Wow. And so, you know, he opened a, he bought the building on North Damon Ave, 1728 and started a factory. And uh, according, according to William F. Ludwig, the second book they opened for business on april 1st 1937 hmm. but they didn't you know they didn't have a lot of footing they didn't have a lot of you know ground because um people just didn't know who they were but but they also on the very first early badges they had a badge that had a little liar design at the top of it and then they used um you know it said william f ludwig drum company at the bottom and they had a Badge was a keystone badge because uh, William F. Ludwig wanted to differentiate himself completely from everybody else. They had like oval badges or mm -hmm. square badges, and and he liked you know the keystone for the uh, the pen, the oil motor logo, and stuff like that, and the sure. and stuff. So he went with a keystone design, but it was probably within by so if they opened in April, it was probably by like the fall where Khan pointed out like you know hey you can't be using the Ludwig name we own that and. And so yeah. it was decided that they should switch. And so after many thoughts of what should we name this, they decided they would call it the WFL drum company. Yeah. Shortly after that, like it's really kind of bizarre because I've had a lot of uh, pre-war WFL stuff and it blows my mind how many different badges I've come across 
with, you know, like some of them will say, you know, WFL drum company, they'll put the address at the bottom. Someone will just say, you know, WFL drum company. And then it says William F. Ludwig president, hmm. or, you know, they're still putting, you know, it's his name. So there's still yeah. some of them say William F. Ludwig around the air hole. Yeah. You know, so they're still trying to get that on there somehow because it's obvious, but I'll say it because the name recognition is what they want to keep because right. Ludwig has built, I mean, they're, they're, at that point, a still already a very well established company. I mean, they've been around since 1909, so it was like uh, pretty important. I guess they were doing everything possible to. <laughs> yes, and it's also going to be tough if you thought about you know you, you're doing a company and, and it's your name. You know, like yeah. you know, like uh, I mean, it's got to be. I don't know. It's going to be tricky. So yeah, um, yeah, that so, must that's that's a hard thing. That must be emotionally kind of like draining to be like I just want to use my own name. But yeah. so if you find a drum that says William F Ludwig in some capacity with, you know, some arrangement, that means it's likely a 1937-ish before it So it, it basically the 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 1937-ish ones will say not a William F. Ludwig drum company on it. It doesn't say WFL drum company uh, anywhere. See. And have the so, lawyer up top. Yes. Yeah. And so after that, they'll say at the top of the badge and block letters like yeah. WFL drum company. Um, okay. And they'll and something like that. And then they'll have a variation maybe at the bottom, you Got know, it. so president um, or whatever. And that's, around that's, the air hole. Yeah. That's what we, I think, traditionally see is that block kind of art deco ish WFL, yes. which is, which is really cool. Um, but God, you you think too about 1937 and just this? It's like pre-war. It's like Great Depression era. I mean, it's really a rough time to be starting a business. But what else yeah. is he going to do? I mean, this is this is his it, life exactly. And I think those are the kind of things that he talked about with his wife, where he was just like, you know, I think in uh, again, there's a great book that William F. Ludwig II wrote, and it's got a lot of history in it as far as like stuff that you would never find anywhere else. And mm. he talks about how. You know, his father had conversations with his mother about like, well, maybe we should buy this apartment building and I'll manage the building or, you know, but it's like, you don't want, you don't want to do that. Yeah. He's a, he's a drum guy, you know, he loves yeah. drums. And, and I think after some hard talks, they just were like, you know what, this is what we want to do. And, yeah. and it was hard because uh, it was real rough in the beginning. They just didn't have anything. And they even went so far as to like, ironically, because the building they bought was around the corner from the Ludwig and Ludwig's you know, original factory. And so they would buy like pieces and parts from Ludwig and Ludwig, you know, like, like leg rests and things like that for like marching drums. Oh, wow. Just because they needed them and they didn't have the tools to machine them yet. And so Jeez. it was, it was just kind of weird for them to like buy them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of like the Ludwig and Ludwig employees, or even then we're like, you know, like, um, Hey, Bill. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, they're they're not like enemies. I mean, it's just something that happened on a on a corporate business level. And I've heard too that they actually, um, you know, it was kind of humiliating for William F. Ludwig II because every now and then he'd have to walk over to Ludwig and Ludwig factory um, and pick up mail that got misdirected. And uh, and I yeah. think the what the Ludwig and Ludwig factory wasn't where they really built stuff anymore. I think it was more of a, a corporate office, but I see, like on Walcott Avenue or whatever it was. Sure. But I think, you know, mail would come there and, you know, he'd have to go over there and retrieve it or something silly like that. Yeah, that's that's just kind of awkward. But yeah. all right. So so let's talk early on 37, because sooner than later, we're going to get into like the war era stuff, because yes. that's kind of a mid that's like the, the middle chunk of all of this. But yeah, let's talk about maybe initial offerings like where they were they like traditionally. I mean, some companies, I feel like even nowadays, they start off making snare drums or something like that. Did did he go full bore drum sets right off the bat or what, what was it, the production like? It looks like they really did go full, full bore drum sets. Like it just, it, there's so many questions that I would just love to ask William F. Ludwig, like for people, for, for guys that basically had no tools and no money. And, and they, it sounds like they had a, a staff of about, you know, like maybe two dozen people and, and, and they were making drum sets. I mean, uh, they actually had an engineer named Cecil Stroop who came up with a lug design, I believe they had the spring loaded inserts in it. And that was, mm. they were Ludwig, uh, WFL was the first company that offered a lug with a spring loaded insert in it. Cause prior to that, you know, people would just tap directly into a lug, which could potentially with, especially with the calf heads constantly going in and out of tune, you know, yeah. constant tuning, you know, people could tend to strip a lug, but uh, of course, you know, that, that was their high end lug. And then they offered another lug, which was called the Zephyr lug, which mm. was, modeled after the Zephyr train and 
And as far as history goes, I guess the Zephyr crane came, you know, was a thing in the thirties. And so I've heard that everything was just streamlined, like, you know, cause people loved the look so much that even toasters and stuff could look, you know, have a yeah. streamlined look to them. Like, a, you know, so yeah. they created these Zephyr lugs, which I've heard a lot of people complain and say they don't like them. I, I love them. They're, they're like tanks. I mean, if you're careful and you thread them in because they don't have any spring inserts and they tap correctly in, but you're just going to be careful when you put them in, you know, and you're just yep. going to make sure you don't crank down on them like carelessly and and they're great. But, yeah. And they have a yeah. really cool Art Deco look to them and a 40s look to them. Yeah, they and, do. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at them now and, and that's so neat. I mean, it's just such a I feel like WFL was at a very special time in, in history, you know, with art. Absolutely. Being, yeah. And one of their and one of their big things that they faced very early on too of course was getting like obviously endorsers that they could use to sort of help promote the company and so their first big endorser was uh, Ray Baduke and so he was with Bob Crosby and 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 so he was the one that you know they modeled the twin strainer you know snare drum after and and it had the new you know the the spring loaded lugs and then Cecil Stroop came up with the you know where they took a uh, there's con confusing stories. I don't know if it was either Cecil Stroop or William F. Ludwig, but one of them, you know, took a pair of pliers to a pair of straight hoops and basically bent the edges back to create a triple flanged hoop. Wow. And and so, you know, they were like one of the probably the first to offer something like that. They had a lot mm. of firsts and things like that. And yeah. William F. Ludwig had a lot of great ideas and Cecil Stroop was a great engineer and blah, blah. And so, um, yeah. Didn't so Cecil they, Stroop have involvement in something that was like a? It might have been with Leedy, but it was yeah, like Leedy something, and Stroop drums. Yeah, Leedy Stroop. Yeah, because it was it was like the the they were messing with the the single knob tension kind of things like well, that. I think single knob tension was later, like fifth, okay. like late forties into fifties. But right. I think Leedy and Stroop was just a real short lived. Yeah. In the early thirties, you know, they had something going where they were, you know, making making something. It may have been like when Ulysses S. Leedy left. You know, Leedy and sold the con. Sure. I think it was like his little. I think I think Leedy passed away early on. I can't remember, but I think it was one of his last you know outings with trying to get a put a drum out there. Yeah. So it may have been something to do with that, but then sure. it didn't last long. Obviously, and Cecil ended up coming to work for WFL and created yeah. a lot of really cool designs. Yeah, but kind of um, an, un an unsung hero like many absolutely, where it's just absolutely. These, these, these names that come up where it's good to kind of actually shine some light on him. But um, yeah, he probably could do a whole you probably, you know, if there was more info on him, you could probably do a whole episode on him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the the twin strainer snare, is that what yes. it's called? Correct. Yes. Can you explain that technology a little bit? So it is a snare drum that um, that has a left and a right side strainer to it. And then they would have fixed at the bottom, like maybe like a regular set of normal snares that were like 10 strand and then maybe the other side would be like silk or like gut snares or something like that okay. like a six strand and so you'd have the option of putting them both on or one on or you know you know either or so wow um so it was pretty unique design and you know uh which is you know later on you'll see like uh, uh maybe the 90s or 2000s i can't remember when dave weckle had a yamaha double strainer drum that was kind of you know somewhat of a throwback to that sure um but yeah. I mean, this was pretty, you know, nobody, nobody had anything like it in the thirties. Everybody always had regular snares or even some companies had, you know, the snare had the snares at the bottom of the top head, which was kind of a weird design. Yeah. But, but yeah. WFL had the only double strainer snare drum, but the tricky thing with those is that they offered um, two different versions of the strainer, which I, I, for this day, I just honestly have no idea why they did this, but the whole patterns are different for each one. So there's a right half, a left half, and then they came in nickel or chrome. And so, you know, trying to replace those or find them is next to impossible. And then the later version, like the one that was came out maybe a couple of years later with the different hole pattern, the tips look thicker, like, like a pair of oars on a boat, hmm. and they tend to break. And so you always find them with the tip broken off, and it's like, you know, good luck finding those. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah. impossible. Yeah. So I have no idea why they, you know, because the original version they had was awesome. It worked great. So it didn't make any sense to me why they would switch to a different design yeah. with a completely different hole pattern. I and I, yeah, cost seems to always be a factor in things. And it's it's true. And it, it's the other odd thing I've discovered too is like that when I first found one like this, I just thought maybe they made them for a left-handed drummer because you'll look at them straight on and then. Some of them will have the strainers to the left side of the badge and some will have them on the right side of the badge. 
And when I found my first one with them to the left side of the badge, I was like, oh, maybe they made them for a left hander or what. But now I've got like, I've seen probably like half a dozen of them in that position. I'm like, okay. It just, like, I, I don't, I don't know why. It keeps it interesting for collecting, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, but, but one thing I've come to with a common theme with uh, WFL is that they, yeah, as you said, they didn't have any money and yeah. they just did whatever they could to make stuff work. And they just basically said, okay, April 1st is coming. That's another year in business. Let's, you know, how many more years can we keep this going? And, and it just grew and it got bigger and better, you know, but they just literally lived hand to mouth, basically, in those very early days. And well, you, you're like reading my mind because I was going to say, so, I mean, how was business doing like financially and all that stuff? I mean, obviously you got drums going out, but like, I mean, were they doing okay? So the first year they started, they actually got an order from a marching band for some marching drums, which really kind of helped them out. And then things got like kind of bleak. And that very first year of business at Christmas, they basically told the employees that they're going to close or they had to close up shop. And, you know, you, if you could find work, do so. But if you come back after Christmas, we'll see what's, uh, what's going on. And they basically, they just limped along until they got through the next year. And then, uh, and William F. Ludwig II, it basically was like, you know, never again, never, not going to let this happen again. And he had basically was going to college and he quit schooling and everything to work for the company. And so he started out as like an advertising manager. And so mm. basically it was his job to go out on the road and, and try and, you know, get endorsers and he would go around Chicago and go to different gigs and try to get people to try the products. So, you know, it's a much different world, obviously not unlike, um, you know, the internet, you know, nowadays where people just put stuff out there. I mean, yeah. he had to literally go out and pound the sand. It's actually kind of not to get off topic, but, uh, the twin strainer I was telling you about for $55, I saw William F. Ludwig the second in a clinic do his history of percussion. And sure. it was around 1990, uh, 1997. And I brought the drum with me and he looked at it and I told him that I could, you know, I knew the drum came from Braintree mass because there was some info with it in the auction and all that. And he said that back around 1937, he literally like on one of his, you know, outings, loaded up a station wagon and his father headed him you know, east and he basically drove out to you know the the new england area or in all that direction with a, well, a station wagon full of drums and he would have to haul them into these music stores and some of them were on like the second floor and you know he would <laughs> haul them up there just to try and see if the music store would be interested in carrying the wfl line and Jeez. and he was like that snare drum you have probably came out on one of my trips out here so yeah which i probably. thought was really cool so Oh, that's that's the that's just the coolest kind of history is that specific and especially with the the Ludwig, you know, family tree. And right. so j just to kind of clarify, so everyone knows. So WFL one, like William F. Ludwig yes. is the founder of WFL drums, as right. we all can, as we all know. But like you said, 19 and it's on the Ludwig website, which I'm looking at 1938 is kind of when you said that, uh, too, when when uh, B2 the yes. chief joined and did exactly what you were just saying with, all I mean, the I think he, he joined somewhere in the, you know, I'm not sure exactly when he quit college, but it was probably within that first year or so that he, okay. you know, joined or at least, cause I think he had always kind of done something from day one, but he was still going yeah. to school. And at yeah. some point I just realized, you know, my grades aren't very good and, and, you know, and the business needs help. And, and yeah. so I think he just finally made the full on decision to, you know, and then he was saying at some point he was making like, you know, that's like ten dollars a week or something, you know, like wow. working for the company as an advertising yeah. manager, and he was living at home, and yeah, and, and so I think they they just put themselves into it all the time, and they and so uh, William F. Ludwig the second had a lot of schooling as well as far as percussion and all that, so he started coming up with like books and and some of the other you know doing the the ad copy for Downbeat magazine things like that, and um, I like I have actually have a book about swing drumming that was put out by William F. Ludwig II. And it's got some great pictures of him in there from when he was like, you know, probably in his twenties hmm. and stuff. And, um, cool. but you'd have to remember like at the time when that swing drumming was coming out, that'd be like today, like somebody saying, you know, um, like it was probably like the Foo Fighters of the day or, or whatever, you know, sure. think of anything that's popular now. Yeah. yeah. And like that, that was, you know, all those big acts were the, the rage of the day. And so, yeah. William F. Ludwig one was probably a little old for that. He probably came from more of a symphonic background and a, you know, a very uh, classically trained background. Yeah. Whereas in William F. Ludwig the second, 
was, you know, had a lot of that as well because growing up, but I think he was also very attuned to the jazz and all that stuff that it was fairly new. So he yeah. was perfect person to go out and be an ambassador for trying to you know, bring in new people. Yeah. Awesome. Door to door, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is totally different. Um, all right. So then uh, push forward there, because I guess, you know, we're, we're, we're nearing a new decade, yes. which turns out to be kind of a problematic time. But um, so what happens then? Well, so they, you know, they, they slowly were gaining some some successes here and there and um, uh, and things, you know, business would just like whatever they felt like all, all of a sudden, um, you know, everything's bleak. And then somebody would send an order in. It was just like at the 11th hour, somebody would order a bunch of stuff and then they would be like, Okay, you know, we're in business again, you know, and they would just they would just grow and build from there. And uh one of the challenges I know William F. Ludwig the second phase is he would go into these music stores and everywhere he went, there was a cardboard cut out of Gene Krupa, and he'd constantly have to battle with that and yeah. and you know, and fight the slingerlins and all that stuff. Yep. Um, and then, you know, they uh but they just plugged along and did their thing. The other thing that's really weird, and um I don't quite understand this, they had a, a couple of lug designs. They just never made it to a catalog or anything like that. Hmm. And um, those are, again, questions I'd love to ask, like, what was this for? But yeah. there's just a couple of weird things that just show up. Like in that swing book I was talking about with William F. Ludwig II, like he's playing a full set of drums with lugs on it that have, they're never in a catalog. Hmm. That's it's interesting. Just, it's just bizarre. And I so, mean, like, it, from what I've heard in other episodes, it would typically be, I mean, you would know, but like prototypes that they made some that just they didn't make enough to put in the catalog or they just tried yeah. it and then just released it. It, it took, it took a good uh, year, but it, they didn't put a catalog out for a year. So there was a whole year that went by, you know, the making just stuff until they had a catalog, but mm -hmm. the catalog certainly helped because they could mail those out and get people interested. And, and I think, you know, in their ad stuff too, for like downbeat and stuff, they would be like saying things like, you know, this is the real Ludwig, you know, make sure you don't, you know, make sure you buy this product because this yeah. is the family and this is the real stuff. Yeah. Whereas in con would probably say, you know, Ludwig and Ludwig drums are the real Ludwig. You know, it's like they sort of battled back and forth with each other. Yeah, because but, that's that's marketing. That's branding. I mean, and of course, yeah. you're going to do that. I mean, it's his family. He's got to get a, a dig in here and there, you know, to. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I've heard and I've, I, I've heard that stores back in those days when carry multiple brands, like a guitar center has, you know, all these different drums in there. Like usually like, you know, so-and-so's music store carried, you know, Gretsch drums or so-and-so carried Slingerland drums. And so yeah. it was, you know, always a battle to try and get your product to be the featured, you know, the one product in that music store. Yeah. So they were always like beating each other out to try and do that. Yeah. Drums are big and they take up a lot of space and you can't have... 30 drum sets in like a 20 by 20 room or something, you know, I'm sure you can, we can squeeze in right. drums in, but in a sales situation. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So WFL, you know, they were, they were moving along with sales and things like that. And they were getting more into the school market and things. And, um, but then like right out of the blue, that brings us to around, you know, 1941 ish. And, um, you know, they had some cool finishes they were offering, like you can kind of see it around my shoulder there, but it's a, a marble, finished Zephyr lug set behind mm -hmm. me. That's, um, you know, so it's, it's a very unique finish. They called it deluxe marble, but, um, it, but in, of course, in December of 1941, when we hit, you know, uh, world war two started and it just brought everything down to, you know, a halt because I want to say that by the next, you know, April of 42 is when the, the metals restrictions started to happen. And yep. so of course, you know, and just as WFL was feeling like, okay, we're starting to get a footing here. They basically got slammed with the whole, you know, metals restriction and the war and all that. Yeah. But I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if you look at it like the pandemic where somebody might complain and say, you know, this is really kind of, you know, ha hampering my ability to do this, but it's not just you, it's everybody. So the war did the yeah. same thing to Slingerland and, and Gretsch and all these other companies got the same problem. So yeah. they all had to kind of scramble to see if they could come up with something in the design or work about so that they could still produce drums somehow. Do you know, I've, 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 I've never actually thought about this. Um, the wooden era wartime drums, all more or less, all the brands kind of have a similar, I mean, what, what else could you do that's different? You know, really a wooden lug, how, how different could it look? They obviously have their like minute differences, but do you know who the first company who was like, let's make wooden lugs, let's make, I mean, rolling bomber gets a lot of the like 
name recognition, yeah. but like, you know, I mean, someone had to be first to create this. I'm not exactly sure who was first. And that's a very good question. And of course, uh, I can't, you know, I know you've talked to uh, Joe Meckler. I'm sure you've yeah. talked to him. And oh, I mean, he's the, he's the definitely the guy when it comes to the wartime stuff. Sure. Sure. Um, I, and I would, you know, it's just hard to find it. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I've had some of it, but I haven't seen a ton of it. And, and a lot of it's usually doesn't, you know, it's been pretty well beat up over the years. So he's got some, you know, some of the nicest examples probably in the world of that stuff. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. but the thing, the thing with WFL, which was, I think may have been another Cecil Stroop designer, if I'm not mistaken, but they used an internal tensioning design, which is basically what, you know, later on the lady knob tension, lady and Ludwig knob tension, but they tried to make a drum that basically used like a spring and, or, or it had like a, um, a mechanism inside and where you turn the sides of the drum, it would push against the head, causing tension. Mm. And I mean, it was really not the greatest design, especially when you're talking about calf heads and all that. And and then yeah. after a while, when you over tension them, they you know they just the, the design would break. And and so yeah. uh, WFL eventually came up with a lug design similar to the rolling bombers, you know, where it just had an insert in the lug, and then you would you know use a tension rod like a normal drum. Mm. But their early offerings were. You know, they were called, you know, the, the wartime um, victorious drums. Okay, so they so, were victorious. Was their, yes. like, you know, patriotic type name? Uh, yeah, and they were, they were, they were vic- you know, they were all, all these companies were trying to sort of, like WFL and Slingerland were always trying to one-up each other and, and yeah. you know, mess with each other somewhere down the line. And Yeah, which that that's neat there, too, because, like, that that feud did not stop when it went to WFL. It's yeah. Just like the hatred just, continued. <laughs> just yeah. Blood Slingerland or whatever. And William and Ludwig the second always battled it out. They would always race to the stockyards to get the calf heads first and pick the yep. best ones. Cause I guess, you know, some of the, the, the calf heads from the, you know, the real fresh, the younger ones or whatever were better for the underside snare heads and sure. things like that. So they were always trying to fight, to, you know, like who can get up earlier and drive across town faster and, you know yeah it's awesome i'd love that, that. Kind of, yeah <laughs> yeah it's pretty neat they, those guys you need some you need an arch enemy if you're in business you know to keep to keep pushing you forward to make more uh uh innovations you know yeah so they they basically uh that's what was going on in in the war and so they had you know and, and fortunately for them they got some uh even uh, because military you know was a lot of the military uses uh drums they got a lot of military contracts for stuff mm. where they would have these big orders of, of marching drums with U.S. logos on them. I have a you know I have a marching drum here that's got the U.S. logo on it, and uh, and I've seen a picture like with that same drum, and there's probably like you know three hundred of them in the picture, you know, and so they made yeah. a lot of them. But cool. even yeah. still, it the business wasn't you know great because it, it was tough without having all the metal and all that. And I believe they went down to a skeleton crew and and really just you know the shop wasn't cranking the way they were even though you know they were still selling stuff but yeah yeah but it, and pe- people probably weren't buying as much because it kind of puts things into perspective and a lot of young guys who would be buying drums were probably over in in the war you know yeah yeah the thing that i think that i find interesting like after the war like i think people just when they see a zephyr log or anything like that they just automatically gravitate and say this is pre-war drum but what they don't realize is that when uh, William F. Ludwig invented the classic lug, like they didn't just like end the war and all of a sudden like, okay, let's throw classic lugs on these. Like they didn't, there was yeah. no classic lug. So basically when the war ended, they did, they had to ramp up regular metal production again, which meant, okay, we're going to start putting Zephyrs back on and, and some of the, you know, the P90 or whatever, the spring loaded lugs and, and, and put those designs back out again. Hmm. But it was really probably no more than a year or maybe even less than a year where I just think both William F. Ludwig and William F. Ludwig II were just like, this design is just, you know, it's all, we just can't, you know, it's just not, not a good design. We got to figure something out. And that's sure. when they basically came up with the classic lug, which, you know, appeared around, I'd say 1947 ish. And so, um, so there are a lot of um, sets because they, there's a famous picture that floats around, a uh, uh, black and white picture of William F. Ludwig uh, and William F. Ludwig II, where they're standing next to a pile of bass drums and they're holding a tom tom. And you look at that picture; the toms have offset Zephyr lugs 
and that should be probably from around 1946. And so for whatever reason, they just, they offset the single, you know, the single each separate tension Zephyr lugs. So they have a, that kind of a weird look to them. Yeah, but it's cool. I mean, that's that offset thing, which is you almost think of it as a modern design, yeah. but it's really not. I mean, it goes way back and that, that picture is so cool. It's kind of, uh, I don't know, you look at it now and you're like, it's a father and son. There's so much like yeah. history to all of it. It's really neat to see. And I always find it funny, too, because I see the picture of William F. Ludwig. Uh, uh, and he always, always had a suit on. And I can remember like my, my dad's father, my grandfather, I didn't really know him that well because he passed away when I was like 16, but he always had a suit on. And I think it was just like, you know, like nobody yeah. does that now, you know, like, no. no, like that'd be like us sitting here doing this interview, both wearing suits and ties yeah. and like yeah. maybe a hat or something. It's yeah. Like, like, nobody wears a suit anymore. And it's just no. like, I got a picture of my grandfather somewhere. He's planting a tree and he's got you know, a full suit on, you know, and it's like, okay, like, what are you doing? Whatever. Uh, they more style, more stylish than we are today, I guess. Absolutely. You know, but William F. Ludwig, you always see him in, his, in a suit. I yeah. don't know if I've ever seen a picture of him without a suit on. So, um, so it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just the, the generation, the way it yeah. was in that, those days. Yeah. And so uh, I find that interesting. The other yeah. thing that's interesting before I move out of the out of the pre-war WFL stuff real quick is that uh, I've got some letterhead and um, that where maybe somebody got a catalog from and the stamp on it uh, actually is like a like the postal stamp is William F. Ludwig's head. And I'm like, what the heck? That's like a collector's dream is to have the <laughs> William F. Ludwig head stamp. I mean, boy, that's pretty cool. And it's and I actually have a because uh, uh, they used to give away these NARD National Association of Rudimental Drummers and uh, the the national, you know, the champion of the guy, whatever, was James Burns Moore. And so he was like the rudimental champion for marching stuff. And so when people completed, you know, the course or whatever, they would get, you know, like a, a little card and it was signed by James Burns Moore and William F. Ludwig Sr. And I wow. have one of those. Cool. It's kind of cool. It's, so it's got, got both of their autographs. Yeah, um, that's the next level of collecting beyond just drums <laughs> is like is memorabilia, yeah. which you're not alone. I mean, and I think it's everyone no. thinks it's awesome. But <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of yeah, I definitely uh, it's a definitely its own thing. Yeah, but um, to propel forward uh, though, like um, so uh, one of the one of the things I think William F. Ludwig Senior and uh, the second decided was like we need to get you know more endorsers and we need like a really big name. And so I think the the trick for them was to say, you know, we, we need to get Buddy Rich. And so the trick was to talk to Buddy Rich, who was a Slingerland guy. And I think Buddy, you know, I mean, it's pretty known that he loved his Slingerlands. But um, I think William F. Ludwig, and they basically told him, like, you know, if you come to WFL, you'll be the guy. Like, if you stay at Slingerland, you're always going to be behind Gene Krupa. Yeah. So, and, you know, there's no way they're ever going to, like, you know, take Gene. I mean, he was on a catalog all the way up until, you know, he passed yeah. away. You know, they yeah. had him on the catalogs and he was, you know, he remained a loyal Slingerland guy all of his years. But, you know, Buddy, you know, was notoriously hopped around later on. But, um, sure. but of course, they, you know, they enticed him and they, they brought him along and they got w WFL got him. So the, the 1948 catalog featuring all the new classic logs and all that had Buddy Rich on the cover. So that'll do it. I mean, that's, that'll do it. Uh, if you, I mean, if you're a branding person and you get Buddy, I'm sure they probably had to pay to get Buddy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm, I don't really understand the endorsement thing as well. And I know you talked to like John to Christopher, and of course he'll, yeah. he'll say that nobody, you know, drum you know, companies don't give away drums these days, or or less. I don't know. There's the stipulations with it and all that. And but yeah. Buddy Rich was probably an exception where it was just like, you know what, you know, I'm gonna play a soup pan. If they'll pay me enough money, I'll play on a you know a soup pan or something. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm pretty sure that um I think Tommy Piorek he he did an episode about Buddy's yes. snares, and I think he talked He's about. He's a great guy. Yeah, Tommy's awesome, and I'm I, I can't remember the details, but like Buddy was the one who kind of like uh how do you put it like kind of tainted the waters a little bit of now money's <laughs> being handed out to play drums. Yeah. <laughs> so uh whatever, it's classic Buddy. I mean, it's it, it, but so how did it do? Did it? Really, did it start to boost oh, sales? Yeah, you know, he was uh, widely, you know, considered the best drummer in the world, and and uh, and I uh, and it definitely helped for sales, and it definitely, you know, they were. Uh, but I guess they the problem they had with him, like over the years, is that um, he would literally um, before he met his wife, he literally would like play these clubs or whatever, and he would like leave with a girl or just like 
whatever it was, he would just leave. And then he'd like literally call up William F. Ludwig II because William F. Ludwig II really kind of had to deal with him. And he'd be like, you know, I need another set. And he'd be like, what? What do you mean you need another set? And he was like, just do it, bird brain. Like, you know, he was, that's what he, you called him, like bird brain. And he would <laughs> oh. say, just, just do it, you know? And so it was frustrating. But I think William F. Ludwig finally got second, got to the point where he was just like, you know what? Let's make like two or three of these things up in advance. And so when he calls now, we just have one ready to go because apparently Buddy had special places he wanted the mouths drilled and this and that. And wow. And so because they had Buddy to, was he was just leaving his like he would get done with a gig. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> I'd love to find one of those. You know? uh, well, it, 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 it's being interesting to know what happened to that stuff. And it's almost it'd be almost next to impossible. Although, you know, if they if he really did have the mouths in special places, it probably wouldn't be that too difficult yeah. to figure out to verify you, the yeah yeah and i don't you and i'm not sure like um uh, not to discredit william if Ludwig the second but sometimes you know he would talk about some things that i've discovered that he was maybe a little off on or you know i mean he yeah. had a, a rich history and that's a lot of stuff to remember and this and that and so and i wouldn't things, blame him one bit if he was no know, think things become tall tales a little bit a, like, absolutely yeah you know every club he went he'd leave a drum set where it might have maybe it happened a couple times or something it prob- like that. probably it was more likely the case yeah. because i don't i don't think it would you know and there's there's ways you can tell like when you look at early um classic lug wfl drums like the very very early ones for some reason on a 9 by 13 they used a mini classic lug only for like a year and then mm. like basically by the next year they were using like a large classic lug and so they were using like large classic lugs on 12s and 13s. It was kind of bizarre. And it yeah. wasn't, in, you know, and then later on, of course, you know, it went to using a, a, a small classic lug for a 12. And then everything above that was a, getting a large one. Weird. And so it's just, just kind of weird stuff like that. And then they didn't really have um, like the early floor toms sat in a cradle. And then they invented the spring loaded legs. And then some of the bass drums didn't have like actual mounts on them. And so they would use a... Um, you know, they would use like a clamp on mount leg mount sure. for the bass drum. And then of course some of the um uh the tom holders were clip onto the hoop, you know, before they invented the banana the the rail and all that stuff. It's uh fun to look at it and see all the different iterations. I guess as a collector, you see I'm sure you never uh run out of interesting things to see as you're finding these you know, and I and I see them all the time. Like I, you know, when I see something that I know is like I think I saw a picture of a WFL set once that I saved where it had classic lugs on it, but the bottom lugs were offset like a Zephyr lug, and I could just tell that like this is probably a holdover from a Zephyr lug drum that they you know outfitted with classic lugs, and just the way it was all set up was all completely like they would have made a Zephyr lug set, but it had classic lugs, so it had to have been probably like a super early, you know, classic lug set. Yeah. And I mean, because it's just hard to know, like, you know, like, I don't think they all of a sudden one day would just say, OK, here's the stopping point for a Zephyr log and here's the starting <laughs> point. for a. And I yeah. know like later they also and it just I didn't realize this until much later on in my collecting, but they actually kept some of the, not the Zephyrs per se, but the the spring loaded early, you know, WFL log. They used them on marching just stuff all the way through the 50s. Hmm. So sometimes you'll come across a marching drum thinking, oh, this is pre-war. And it's not, it's could, you know, it's probably like mid fifties or something. Yeah. I mean, but like you said, it's like, well, we have it, we're not going to get rid of it. Or we have, even if we're making new, new ones of it, we have all this tooling, like, yeah, why not? Um, so, all right, we're, we're, we're entering close to, we're close to the fifties, right? Things are, we're sort of winding down in the, in the, um, uh, in the in the world of in, in this timeline of, of WFL. But I, I wanted to ask kind of while we're, while we're talking here, so Ludwig and Ludwig was still in existence and creating drums under the name Lud- or or did it become Lady and Ludwig at this so, point? During the war, I think uh Ludwig and Ludwig and Lady were, you know, Lady was making like a dreadnought. Yeah. And I forget what the Ludwig and Ludwig version was called, but they were still doing their thing. And I think after the war ended, I think at some point, I don't know the exact date, they just kind of said, you know, this is silly. We're making, you know, we're spending all this money to make two different drums and Let's just make one. And they combined the two names together where you get Lady and Ludwig. And so that's, you know, where you see that happening. But it really gotcha. was like, I want to say up into the very early 50s. And then I think Con Corporation altogether was just like, you know what? I mean, we're just, we're done. We're, we're not going to make drums anymore. We're sick of this. Or we're going to concentrate more on other stuff. And yeah. so they decided that they were going to sell the name. And so that's when um, 
William F. Ludwig II was really, he was the one that said, you know, we need to get the name back because he was adamant that they wanted the name. And I think Senior was just like, you know, I don't care, whatever, we're WFL drums now, like, who cares? And it was really William F. Ludwig II. Like, I have a lot of respect for him, the, the choices he made. And, you know, yeah. he was, I think, because, you know, the father lived through a depression and all that. He was very cautionary as far as spending money and doing things. And it was, you know, it was going to cost a lot of money to get the name back. But William F. Ludwig II had a lot of foresight in saying, you know, we need to get our name back. Like, this is our name and we need to have it. And um, yeah. so wow. basically, from what I understand, I think Senior went on a vacation to like uh, Florida or something like that. And while he was gone, William F. Ludwig II went ahead and, and purchased, you know, the Ludwig name back, which included a lot of the tools and the, you know, the dyes and the tooling and all that stuff. But conversely, Bud Slingerland, you know, went ahead and decided to purchase the, the leading name because they, their thought process at the time was if we have Slingerland and Leedy, then we have more of a chance of boxing out Ludwig in a store. Whereas in like one store we'll have Slingerland, then we can put Leedy in another one and, and, and you know, kind of like Man. try to, you know, you know, it's probably a lifelong dream of theirs to screw <laughs> each other over, you know, yeah. like. Like he's, so, they, they they sit up at night dreaming of ways <laughs> that they can completely screw each other over. I mean, that's just <laughs> it's interesting to think of WFL one going senior going like, no, I'm WFL now. I don't care because like we have such hindsight now where we can look back and WFL. If you look at the big Ludwig history, it almost feels like a little blip of yeah. like time, but it's not. I mean, that's a, a relatively substantial amount of time. That's 18 years that uh, WFL existed, which that's a substantial amount of time. So there's actually, uh, and I have it somewhere I have to dig for it, but I, there's an actually a, a, a clip ad or something I've seen where I want to say it's 1954 where they officially announced that they bought their name back. Um, however, okay. they, as I said earlier, when they didn't like to waste or use anything, you really don't see uh, the change occur until about 1950, 58, maybe 57 with a transition badge. So, gotcha. so there's a, there's still a lot of years where they're using a WFL badge, even though they technically bought the name back, yeah. which it seems kind of weird to me that they used them for that long because the badge has also changed. So when you get after, you know, post-war, there are some badges that are aluminum badges and they and usually by this point the badges say at the top they'll say will they'll say WFL Drum Company like CO, and then at the bottom they'll have like seventeen twenty eight North Damon Ave as the address, and then you'll see some of them that are like um, as I said they're aluminum looking badges, but then they mostly you know after about nineteen fifty or so they're all like brass badges, but um, by nineteen fifty five fifty six maybe the badge all of a sudden changed so it says WFL Drums. D R U M S at the top. And then they'll, you know, put the address at the bottom or there or, or you know, you know, Ludwig Chicago. It'll say Ludwig Drum Company at the bottom or something. Yeah. You know, and it's just kind of a kind of a weird thing. And also yeah. it's good to note that I think around maybe either fifty five or maybe fifty six is when they first started to date stamp drums. So prior to that, they were never date stamping drums. And so um so that's kind of cool. And sometimes yeah, yeah. It, the, the dates are hard to read because, uh, first of all, they're old and uh, they used a red ink stamp back in the, you know, starting off. And so the insides of those drums were like a dark African mahogany. So when you put a red stamp ink, you know, it's just it sometimes can be hard to read it if your eyes yeah. aren't really catching it. And then yeah. they also would stamp, ironically, they would stamp the stamp on the inside of the shell close to like if you're looking in where the badge is, it was right next to the badge hole. So later on, like, you know, when you're looking at like 60s drums, well, most of the time you can look through the air hole and see the date. And I don't know if like, I mean, obviously the, the stuff isn't food, but I don't know if they were like trying to like keep track of like dates on some of them just for like getting them out the door versus, you know. Yeah, I don't that's know. That's a good point. No, that's a great point of like, how long has this one been sitting here? Because otherwise, like, how do you, I mean, you got, we're talking warehouses. We're talking. Yeah. And that must have been such a relief to get the name back. I kind of like though, that they weren't that after it happened, they were like, yeah, we'll just run. We'll just, we'll burn through all the WFL stuff before having like a hard switch yeah. over. Um, yeah. Cause yeah. And I, and I think William F. Ludwig senior was, was pretty furious with, with, you know, the second for doing that. But I mean, I, you know, obviously like later on, he, 
he probably much, you know, rightfully so discovered that he was really right about doing that. Yeah. A couple of years later with the whole 60s, you know, the, explosion. You know Beatles and all that. Yeah. And, and I mean, they could never have predicted that. Do you know, I mean, you know, I, you know, it's one of those things where it happened so long ago. I feel like money can be kind of a weird thing to like, I'm not sure if it's released, but like, do people know what W, what the, the Ludwigs paid to buy their name back? Is that public record at all? It may be, it actually may be in William F. Ludwig's book. Cause he, he talks about like his book is way more like detailed than the stuff sure. that I'm talking about. Like he talks about sales figures, things like that. And things that I wouldn't, you know, necessarily memorize. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. he'll, you know, he has like the quarterly figures. It sounds like a lot of people in those days too, were pretty good about keeping records. Like they just saved a lot of stuff record wise. Like yeah. I've heard from some people that I know that have like basically like the file contents of William F. Ludwig the seconds, all of his stuff from his desk and his boxes and stuff that goes back to like patents and all things like that, which I would love to look at because yeah. it would certainly fill in some holes as to when something specifically came out. Yeah, and, um, but it, it makes sense because it's like now we have our computer files completely full of stuff on hard drives. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like his 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 office where he has a filing cabinet. Of course, he would want to keep that stuff. Um, yeah. But, well, um, how would you wrap up kind of this this WFL nice uh, like journey? I mean, it's really just a big detour for the family. Like senior was angry <laughs> at first but then it must have been like uh in the 60s it had to just be like okay i get it i get why you did this well it, and i think you know exactly i think um i think i just i can't give enough credit to william of love the second for his just insight and just you know i think he just really had a good head for for just knowing like how to move forwards and whereas and I think he was more willing to take chances where I think, you know, senior took well, certainly took a lot of chances back in the day, but he also got burned back in the day quite a bit where he was a lot less reluctant to make an unnecessary move just for the sake of, you know, taking that chance. But yeah. I think uh, William F. Ludwig had certainly had a good pulse a finger on what was happening. And I think he was able to really kind of see how to proceed and move forwards and, yeah. And and he made some great choices because uh, there's, you know, I think they were people say that they, you know, that they weren't using a uh, a Ludwig logo prior to the Beatles being on and, and selling. But that's really not true. As you know, you there's there's copy ads of uh, Joe Morello in the 50s playing, you know, his WFL drums that have a Ludwig logo on the on the head. But yeah. I don't think it was common practice for them to regularly like just, you know, put a logo on everything. Uh, yeah, and of course, sure. there was no WFL logo. Like if you ever, you know, people have sort of created them over the years from maybe using, as you say, that Art Deco look logo, and they'll make, you know, stickers to put on a bass drum, but there never were sets floating around. And of course, the advent of the plastic head. Yeah. Was 56, something, 57. Yeah. Yeah. So that changed some things, of course, as far as putting logos on things and stuff like that. And yeah. And uh yeah, that's so, interesting. So so you're saying that there was never a WFL like what we expect now with like you know, DW or Yamaha, these brands. Yeah. And one thing I think is interesting on that that I want to throw in there is I was reading uh, uh, Brooks Tegler's Gene Krupa gear guide book, and it was um, talking about how Gene, it was the same story you always heard about Ringo, about over his shoulder or over George's or Paul or John, their shoulder, you'd see the Ludwig logo and everyone loved it. And I think it was the similar story with Slingerland about how yeah. or way earlier than that, they saw that this was always appearing, you know, jeans, bass drum, let's put a Slingerland logo on it. So yeah. kind of an interesting side thing with that feud that we always hear about. It's like, uh, you know, maybe Slingerland did it earlier with, with, it's, the, yeah, it's certainly possible. And it's just, there's just a lot of things like that. And, uh, you would think that, you know, like, I think later when Buddy Rich was on TV, they maybe had like a lot big logo on his head or something like that. But of yeah. course, you know, Buddy Rich, as awesome as Buddy Rich is and was, and he just didn't, you know, have the impact like the way, you know, Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And yep. so, of course, uh, I think it was just more of like when when Ludwig did it or WFL did it for Buddy Rich and all that, it was just more of a standard like promotional thing. Whereas, and I don't think they necessarily thought like we're going to sell a billion drum sets because Buddy Rich is playing, you know, on TV on like the Merv Griffin show or whatever yeah. it was. And, yeah. you know, people are going to watch that and buy tons of Ludwig drums, but it was just a way for them to sort of get the name out there, especially when you're looking at black and white TV, it's probably real hard to pick out, you know, then have HD, you know, yeah. TVs and all that. Yeah. But then of course, uh, Ringo's logo of course was put on there, you know, by 
by, you know, the, the sign painter and in the quest of, you know, Brian Epstein and the, and the store owner, Ivor Arbiter. And it was just nothing that Ludwig had a hand in. So when Ringo went on TV, I think it was more or less like, wow, what is, what is that? You know, like <laughs> yeah. these guys were on TV and the logo was actually kind of big. It wasn't even a Ludwig, like it didn't come from the factory. The sign painter, like Eddie Stokes painted the thing larger than like an actual Ludwig logo. So it's like, you know, it showed up really well on TV. So yeah. and then, I think it was quite the shock to the factory. And, yeah. And then the rest, I mean, truly, you can say the rest is history because it like, really is. I mean, that's where I just love that. It's like WFL is just this like sliver of just it's a specific era. And and it's just so much. It's just really neat. And I think they're very unique drums that are so embedded in the history of the drum set like the Ludwig family but it's like a it's like a little like side history you know yeah. like that 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 is not uh kind of on the main you know it almost just gets folded into oh yeah that was the WFL era but there's a lot to it you know yeah and so one of the other cool things so about the WFL era especially like in the 50s and stuff is and I have no idea how they did this but they would wrap literally the wrap into the shells so like you know you'd see drums where like there'd be blue sparkle on the outside and then red sparkle was on the flip side of the wrap and so you could see a little section of it peeking through all the way to the inside of the shell hmm. where like a little red sparkle would poke out of there. And, wow. uh, and they also used like a glass glitter finish in the fifties when they switched, you know, around you know, 1959, 60 to a more like uh, there was a little transition finish. And then they went to a regular sparkle in the sixties, but all those hmm. glass glitters look really cool, but they were yeah. really prone to fading. So some of them, like, unfortunately, like the gold and the greens, they just turned some big putrid looking, you know, <laughs> no, the green sparkle looked absolutely gorgeous back in the oh, day, back in, but it just it gets yellowed and looks it's pretty bad. That's a shame. Now, uh, as we wrap up, I just got to ask, like, collectability wise, like if you find like, let's say a 1937 WFL kit. And I mean, this is a whole I'm sure this is a lifetime worth of studying basically this all this stuff. But mm -hmm. And just WFL in general, like, you know, one to 10, where do you put collectability of these drums? Because they're not everywhere. They're not popping up all over the place. I mean, honestly, as much as I pains me to say this, I would probably put the collectability around maybe like a five or a six, only okay. because depending on what the set is or uh, like my set in particular behind me is um, a single headed Tom's and it came from the factory that way. And it just the. Uh, the hardware is like really minimalistic and it doesn't really resemble as much of a, um, I mean, there, there are certainly places you could play one, but yeah. I feel like, you know, classic lug fifties drums are something more likely to be taken out on, on an everyday gig. You yeah. could be in a punk band and probably bring out, you know, a 1955 set of WFL drums and they'd, they'd work fine. Yeah. Whereas in, I think bringing out a 1937 set, you know, Bass drum sizes were a lot larger, and it's just, it just yeah. The single super, tension, yeah. I mean, it, it's not practical. That's that's a good point of like how practicality they're, they're super can, cool, and they just but they just don't really fit more or less. I mean, because when you look at a WFL drum from the fifties uh, and stuff, they you know they're very much resemble a, like a sixties drum in look. You know, they still have the same you know basic dimensions, classic lugs, and, and they're built like tanks, and and they're just you know. They're a lot more uh, user friendly. I mean, some some people might say the hardware is not that that great, but you know, they I'd totally gig out like on a regular basis. I would gig a fifties WFL set, whereas in I probably would be a lot reluctant to uh, bring out like a Zephyr Lug set. Yeah, but it's yeah. possible. It certainly is possible. And I mean, if you look at it, blows my mind that Bunny Carlos toured with Cheat Trick with a uh, a Radio King set. Like he literally had a full on nineteen you thirties know, forties wow. Radio King set. <laughs> <laughs> and he used it during Budokan, you know. And it oh just, my God! Wow, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's awesome. amazing, you know. So yeah, Kurt, this has been awesome. I got to say, you have a uh, just you are a wealth of information about this stuff, and I can tell that you're you're passionate about it and and find a lot of fun in collecting. Um, and hopefully, we'll meet at one of the drum shows. That would um, be excellent. Yeah, which I'll be I'll be starting to attend soon as I'm as I emerge from this uh, insanity of. Uh, 
small babies, children, yeah. babies and small children. Anyway, so Kurt has been kind enough. He's going to stick around and uh, he's going to join me for a bonus episode where we've, we kind of talked about it a little bit. We're going to talk about some collecting stories of finding some of these ultra rare WFL drums. Um, but then also uh, Kurt is a fan and collector of canister thrones, which that's a cool topic right there. Um, so I'm excited to learn more about that. So if you want to hear that bonus episode with Kurt, um, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon link, and there's all kinds of episodes there um, from previous guests, and Kurt will be there as well. So, Kurt, as we wrap up, man, I mean, this has just been awesome. I'm so glad to have had you on here. Um, I think maybe you could come back in the future. You know a lot of stuff. I'd love to have you back sometime. That would be great. I really appreciate you having me on here. Thank you, Kurt. All right. <laughs>